because adversity is often the breeding ground for development. Dive into neurointerventional stories, the uncensored interviews. Our guests, all leaders in the field of neurointervention, share the difficulties they face, the complications they have had to manage, and speak without filters on little discussed, sometimes controversial, or simply taboo subjects. Hello, my name is Nantia Sujijan Tararat, and today I am pleased to welcome Dr. Laman from the UK for this new episode of INR Stories. Dr. Laman, welcome. Thank you. So we'll first start out by some introduction. If you wouldn't mind, kind of walk us through who you are today and your path to get here. I work as an INR in Birmingham, and I've been there for about 20 years. My story began a long time ago in Tripoli in Libya where I trained as a, a medic. And after that, there was no job. So, and I was also looking for something else, more adventurous, a new chapter of my life. So I decided to come to the UK. My training and education was in English, so it was an easy choice for me. Yeah, I came from a, a humble family, so I had to gather all the funding I could gather to be able to leave and support myself for a certain bit of time. So it, it took me a while to do that. At that time, there was a Gaddafi ruling the country, so I almost smuggled myself out of Tripoli into Malta, and from Malta I came to England. In fact, I didn't land in England. I took a flight from London to Glasgow, where I had a friend there who I thought will help me to settle down. It took a while to settle, do the exams, and then I went to London. I did the Royal College of Radiology exams and the equivalent exams to be able to practice and have a license. Initially, I did medicine. I did for many years until I settled in the UK. And then it wasn't for me, really. I didn't like it. An opening came up in Manchester for radiology. So I worked for four years as resident. Then I wanted to do neurointervention my mentor and trainer and very good friend, Joe Batsharia, who took me under his wings and trained me there. Following that, I think I spent two and a half years or three years, and then I moved to Birmingham, where I had my consultant job in Birmingham. My wife is from Birmingham, so we settled there very nicely, and I've been there since. It's a long career to unpack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you have to pick the hardest part of what you've had to go, I mean, which you had to go through a lot uh, yeah, to get here. But I think it's the first year being here on your own, mm -hmm. not knowing what will happen with limited funds. That was the hardest part. I think once I started working and had my license, it's things settled down. What kept you going at that time? Hope. Yeah. Yeah. No. Just hope and the pathway was clear you do the exams you get a job you settle down and you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you move on but there's always that nagging feeling that something might go wrong so it's it's hard it's the uncertainty yeah. right so what inspired you to go into neurointervention was there any in events in particular I think it was, I was doing diabetes and in the chronology and one of the uh, Friday meetings, usually we have somebody coming from outside the hospital to talk to us about new advances in certain aspects of medicine. And that time there was a talk by, I think it's Andy Molino about coiling mm. that being taken up as the main treatment of so I was fascinated by it, and it was always in the back of my mind. And when I did the radiology afterwards, you do settlement or stations in different specialties of radiology, and new radiology seemed to be the one I liked. So you were, as I understand, part of the very early trials and adopters of pipeline in this region. Can you talk to me a little bit about that and how that came about? There are aneurysms which we always find it difficult to manage. And when flow diversion came, it's the silk device that came first. I used it, but not great results. And there was a lot of noise around it. Some patients weren't doing well with hemorrhages. And, and then pipeline came in 2009. I asked the company if I can use it. They brought David Torella to Proctor and Dr. Nelson as well. 
so I did few cases with them and then uh, from there it evolved into being one of the main users of the device in Europe and then I was involved later on in the registry of the pipeline not the classic but the um, flex and then when the shield came out I did their first in human and then involved in the shield trial and the registry and eventually the inspire registry i'm on the steering committee with few other physicians and we've been running it for quite a while now do you think that the you know your early involvement in these trials was driven by kind of your own curiosity your volume it's a combination of several things really I, i think i saw what it can do there are aneurysms which are not treatable in any other way and constructing the vessel and treating the disease not the manifestation of the disease was one of the things that flow diversion does and our volume is also very important we do a lot of cases so the volume was helping and after flow diversion intersecular came out so we adopted the web early adopters of the web and involved in some of their trials but it was an eye opener to use it and then try and use other devices as well so f- because of our involvement with web we were one of the first users of rts for instance and contour and i think we kind of the pathways for us is easier than most places because the hospital is very understanding and helpful to understand the safety of these devices is probably superior and i think the efficacy is not bad at all despite all the rumors so yes i am a, a big advocate of flow diversion and intracellular devices what do you think is the future of hemorrhagic field Hemorrhagic and the transformation has been so much in the last decade or so with flow diversion and intersecular and I think it's more about having devices that are much better than the previous ones for instance intersecular devices which has less reliant perhaps on the individual to size the device the main problem with intersecular is sizing yeah and having devices that perhaps more sturdy with less recurrences and more efficacious in the long term with flow diversion i think it's the antitromogenicity perhaps becoming more and more efficient despite the coating of these devices and the surface modification i think we still need antiplatelets i can't see us not using antiplatelets at all but perhaps reducing the duration and in term reducing the complication of this procedure will be the aim i think the involvement of ai will be great in the future with sizing with designing the devices with perhaps it becomes patient centric with the ease of analyzing and producing and even manufacturing it might be a different story in 10 20 years time and perhaps the robotic might take a different view on because currently it's not really there but i think with the advancement in computer technology maybe that will come so your group just published an article in AJNR on the sizing actually lateral compression yeah. m- manipulation a simple approach for sizing taller than wide yeah. aneurysm can you talk a little bit about that piece and and uh, the conclusion it's about sizing devices in the right way so the, the aneurysms are easy if they are barrel shaped and square but then you have aneurysms which are different shapes for instance uh, a rounded aneurysm we found that if you size as usual and use a SL device but don't take the one off from the height it will fit well because it's a volume size it's not it's a, the main drive for all this sizing which we publish is the volume of the aneurysm the idea is extracted from the volume and obviously as you know the more lateral compression the better Can you talk a little bit about your involvement with um, P64 which I understand is not available in the US just yet? 
Yeah, it's it's a device which the interest is in the coating study, which we are part of and uh, on the steering committee for it. It's a randomized controlled trial of P64 HPC, which is the coated device with a single antiplatelet, which is either Brasigril or Ticagrelol, against the non-coated device on dual antiplatelet. It's a non-inferiority trial. And the primary endpoint is to test whether there is any hits on MR on the diffusion weighted scans done within 48 hours of the procedure. I think the recruitment has finished now, so we're waiting the final results. Another way of finding out whether we need antiplatelets, dual antiplatelets or not. Right, right. And we'll wrap this up with the three questions that we ask all of the interviewees. And the first is, if you take a journey through time and go back 10 to 15 years, what would you do differently in your path? I would have picked up the fact that perhaps stroke will be as big as it is now. And yeah, the innovations that happened in the last 10 years are quite impressive. So uh, initially, I wasn't paying attention to it, but I wish I did. And if we fast forward 15, 20 years from now, where do you think our field will be? Our field, I think, will be dominated by ischemic stroke. I worry about the hemorrhagic stroke aspect, especially in in countries where it's consultant-led, where I think trainees and junior consultants will not have the exposure that we did in terms of numbers of hemorrhagic strokes. Because of the demand on the service, you will have more and more people appointed to do the job and therefore less hemorrhagic cases per person. So that's my main worry in 20 years time. But I think the specialty is thriving. As you can see in this meeting and others, there is innovations has still happening, enthusiastic young people coming through. Yeah, I think it's in good hands. And if we turn our attention to the training of neurointerventionalists coming out today, what do you think we're not saying or doing enough for them? I believe in the traditional uh, training. If you are a trainee, you just have to work hard, do the cases that you need to do, study your anatomy because it's the safest way of having less complications. But obviously support is important. I don't think there is lack of it. And if there is, it's on individual basis. The majority of people I know, I think they support their trainees very well perhaps encourage more women to come into the field. And I think they are coming now, but not as much as I would like to. More every year. It's very encouraging. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Thank you.